Welcome back, everyone. It's 11-2 of 2015. We're going to take a look at uh, some work by uh, Jean Hippolyte on uh, his uh, treatise on Hegel. Uh, it was actually published in French in 1946, but Northwestern University published it in 1974. We're going to take a look at this English translation. It's entitled Genesis and Structure of Hegel's Philosophy of Spirit. So it is a, a look at the phenomenology, Hegel's phenomenology, but it's going to look at it uh, from the perspective of uh, a philosopher who is credited with really launching uh, the uh, French postmodern interpretation of Hegel, you know, Jean Hippolyte. So we're going to take a look at uh, the first section, pages 77 to 100, on sensuous certainty. And when you look at the chart, it's basically going to start from bottom to top. We're actually going to begin at the bottom of the of the chart because it's going to be the uh, sentient or the sensate area of uh, the brain and the intellect. And then as we move higher up on the chart, we're going to move up toward consciousness and the cognitive. And then we'll swing over to the right side of the page, which will be the realm of self-consciousness. But we begin lower left which is going to be the sentient mind, the sentient uh, intellect, before it passes into the more cognitive realm. And so this section deals with sensuous certainties. So we're going to begin in block one at the lower left, sensation as object. And uh, the object is the given in experience initially for an individual. Uh, so basically we just look at uh, the given determinant and that becomes our reality. The self does not distinguish itself from its object. There's no birth of a subjectivity as yet. And nothing can be separated out of or abstracted out of the object as a, as a formal abstraction. So initially, when we confront our existence, the logos of being, as it exists, resists being abstracted out. There's a resistance of the Logos from being abstracted out in this initial first moment where we just are confronted by our sentient uh, objects. The Logos is uh, resisting being abstracted out. So we only identify specific things as kind of intuitive phantasms. In our first moment we just more or less deal with a very sensate intuitive phantasms. We don't really delve into any form of consciousness whatsoever. There's no abstraction, there's no separating out, and there's no birth of subjectivity. Now, in note two, we have a transitional moment. Consciousness begins alternating between the specific uh, object of, as a phantasm and subjective positing. We start, start to just trigger a little bit of subjective positing. And there are, a two-sidedness becomes a awakened as an essential aspect of ascertaining being. There's an opposition set up between being and doxa opinion, and doxa is used here in the Greek as opinion. So it's not used, uh, it has, doxa as a concept is used in a lot of different ways, but in this philosophy by Hegel it's used as, doxa is used as the doxa opinion, or a uh, individuality, an individual um, intuitive experience. It's a doxa opinion of what reality is. But we have this uh, birth of an opposition between our aim of trying to reach being and this doxa opinion that kind of veils the being which hides behind it. Uh, being as an essence hides behind this doxa opinion. But we do realize that being must be expressed as an abstraction. So now we, re we begin to re review and, or, and or view reality as a mediation of sorts. We start to believe that reality mediates a deeper, more essential truth. That the true is mediated somehow in this, uh, behind this veil of the doxa individuality. It's some, somewhere behind the sensate, somewhere behind the sentient, lies the essence hiding behind mediation. And so sensation as object initially is just very simply the intuitive phantasm that we grasp, and there's no um, abstraction whatsoever. 
but we do have a little bit of a, a birth of a proto-subjectivity that begins to question itself. Now the self-questioning leads to the second moment of sensation as subject. So we move from sensation as object to sensation as subject. The moment of negation, the self determines um, to aim for being, uh, for the essence of being, by negating all of the particulars of the things that we confront. It's a aim for being through negation of particular. So the self aims at the qualitative thing in itself. And as a first negation, the self only acquires an atomic qualitative determinant. We don't reach anything, any form of universality whatsoever. Negation simply um, peels back the layers to reach an atomic singularity of a determinant as a, a thing in itself, but it's still going to be a very determinate thing in itself. So it's kind of a proto-abstraction. It remains atomic. We simply end up with a space now that contains a group of simultaneous determinate singularities. We end up with a space containing a group of determinate singularities, or simultaneous singularities. But the subject, as knowledge, becomes posited as the true, and we, we, we start thinking about um, our own subjectivity. Self posits the idea that sensuous certainty is contained in the self. The concept of the I is born, or the concept of subjectivity is born, but subjectivity immediately leads to the notion of intersubjectivity, or the common I. Very essential for understanding Hegel is that uh, from the very beginning here of this unfolding of his logic, intersubjectivity comes to the forefront. We're going to start thinking of intersubjectivity as a proto-universality. We're already getting a first peak, a proto-universal peak into universality as intersubjectivity. Intersubjectivity is born as a concept, as a proto-concept. So we end up with this birth of the common eye, and therefore the true is understood to entail a deeper interpenetration. Now we can enter in, because it is a common eye, we enter into a dialogue, and through dialogue, the self reaches a more concrete sphere and forms the thing as a generalized name. So now we move on from a kind of a sensual phantasm to a generalized name for the things we confront. We, uh, through dialogue, we can form an intersubjective, generalized name for things. And that brings us to the third moment of sensation as return and relation. We've had sensation as object. We transition to sensation as subject. And now we transition to the synthesis as sensation as return and relation. Self posits the idea that mediation cannot be determined simply as generalization, but that mediation can occur within the sensuous itself, that the sensuous itself contains this interpenetrating deeper mediation. There's no need to go any further. We have to go outside of ourselves into some kind of a intersubjective generalization, but the sensuous veil itself that uh, presents itself to us contains within itself the mediation of the true. The mediation of the true is the sensuous itself. So the now is perceived as a becoming of essence and is viewed eschatologically and possesses an eschatological nature. And we end up with the first moment being reflected back on itself with that which we have gained in the second moment. And so we now perceive, rather than a space of uh, individualities, we now perceive our historical space as a space of being capital letters, which is comprised of a unity of beings lowercase. Being is a singularity that encloses a multiplicity of lowercase beings. Knowledge becomes genuine perception, and we're ready to discover how this moment of return and perception will unfold. We now move on to a deeper truth, a truth of true perception. We first uh, discovered through uh, the first moment of dealing simply with uh, kind of like uh, 
sensuous phantasms that we moved on through the idea of subjectivity and intersubjectivity of acquiring intersubjective generalized names for the things we confront. But then we kind of moved on from there and realized that it's not simply intersubjective generalizations that count for the universal, but the universal, the, the essence, the essential, is actually within this veil of sensuous reality itself as that which is hidden behind this sensuous veil of reality. That the essence, that the concept of being exists within the sensuous itself. And so we fold back to the first moment. We return. We fold back reflectively to the first moment of the sensuous. But now we're dealing with an interrelatedness between objectivity and subjectivity. Objectivity and subjectivity become inter-reciprocal, and their inter-reciprocal relationship is going to define a new idea of being. A new idea of being will emerge through the reciprocal interpenetration between objectivity and subjectivity. And that, of course, sets up the entirety of Hegel's process, and that's why we have these first three moments to give birth to this idea that Hegel's system is going to involve a reciprocal relationship between subjectivity and objectivity in the definition and the acquisition of universal truth of being. The truth of being is acquired through an interpersonal, interreciprocal relationship between objectivity and subjectivity. It's all born in this first section where we acquire true perception. But we need to get a better look at true perception, and that's going to be taken up in our next talk. So we'll wrap up this first uh, lesson on uh, Jean Hippolyte, and we'll pick up the next lesson uh, next time.